morning River Church and uh, welcome to another Sunday morning online. It's such a privilege for me to get to share what I feel God's got on my heart for us again this Sunday. Um, and yeah, just such a such an amazing time this week walking through the devotions. It's been such a privilege to, to have so many folks sharing in them and I, I look forward to the week that's coming and what God's going to do um, in this week. And I want to encourage you, if you've, if you've got a testimony, if you've got something that you feel um, that God has really spoken to you through this time. Maybe He set you free from something. Maybe He's built something into you or just brought something to the surface that you never knew was there. Or maybe He's done something in your life um, through these uh, devotions and through the time you've spent with Him. I want to ask you, won't you let us know? Uh, won't, you, won't you give us a shout and, and just tell us what God's been busy with in your life and, and how He is working at the moment in your life. You know, our God is a, a God who is alive and who's active and who's so involved in our lives. And I, that's what separates Him out amongst many other things from um, many other things that set themselves up as God's. Um, so we want to hear your testimonies. We know that there's power in the testimony. When you share your testimonies of what God is doing in your life, uh, He may open it up in someone else's life. So won't you, uh, won't you let us know if you've got something to share out of this this moment of lockdown and, and being with um, being with God in these these times of devotion. But um, you know the, the lockdown has brought across our lives many many new moments. Perhaps there's there's some things that um, you know that you've done that you've never done before. I know for me there certainly have been a few firsts, and and one of them has been a, you know some birthdays that uh, some folks have had uh, during the lockdown. And our our, um, our middle son Zach. He had his 10th birthday, double figures, it's a big one. He had his middle birthday uh, during lockdown now on the 1st of May. And, and it was amazing. Um, we couldn't obviously have a birthday party for him with all his friends and all his mates and what he wanted to do. And we couldn't have an outing or anything like that. But what we did is we, we organized a, a Zoom party. So all of his um, friends to be able to connect him via Zoom. And it was amazing. It was crazy. We had family from all over the world, part of it. We had family from New Zealand and England and uh, friends from around the country. Um, local and uh, far away that were family that were able to be part of that and it was amazing but we still asked him you know what do you want what is you what, you, what is a theme for your party and and Zach chose uh, a superhero dress-up party and he loves to dress up man he loves to we've got these old uh, superhero costumes spider-man superman ninja turtles those sort of things and um, and he chose to to dress up uh, for for his party and, and all the friends obviously as well dressed up many of them so but there's, it was just something in that that spoke to me um, about, you know, as, as kids, they, they love to, to play superheroes and love to pretend. And our boys are mad about Star Wars at the moment. And, and everything is, is uh, you know, just Star Wars and lightsabers and things like that at the moment. But, you know, so often in, in, in stories, we love to read ourselves into stories. And that's the beauty of a story. And that's the... Um, the the draw in, into into fiction, but you know very often we, we see ourselves as the protagonist. We see ourselves as the hero. Uh, we see ourselves as, as the person who um, is the is the main character in the story. And, and I think there's a there's a reason for that. And, and part of that reason is that God has built uh, the divine into each one of us. That we are made in that image of God, and, and we are made uh, with something of an imprint of God in our lives, where only that divine fits in. And, um, and you know, often we, we, we love to be the hero and love to picture ourselves as, as somebody, you know, even if it's in a, in a Bible story, perhaps you, 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 know, you, you see yourself and, and you read the story of Moses and you, and you love to think, man, I've, I would love to have something of that prophetic leadership and, uh, that, that Moses has. Or you, you see the courage of David and the lion and the bear and taking on Goliath with the sling. And, um, you know, perhaps it's the, the, the apostolic brilliance of Paul that you see and born into the right family and this amazing education and powerful conversion and how God uses them to speak to, to churches across the known world at the time and to plant churches and you know I think we, we, all, we all have some of those um, Bible heroes that we want to read into our own lives and we want to see ourselves in those moments but sometimes we, we read a story and, and we actually realize mm, perhaps I'm not the hero in the story perhaps I'm the I'm the one who's getting the lesson in this, and you know, if I look at the at the Bible, I think for me, um, somebody who I identify with a lot in my life, not not by choice, but just in if I if I take an honest look at my life, um, is is Peter, and um, you know, Peter was a Peter was a brash guy. He was he was usually the first to speak. He was kind of out there. He was 
from a blue collar working class family, a fisherman, um, you know, quite, quite rough and ready, not scared to whip out the sword and have a go at somebody. Um, you know, he was, he was bold and brash and out there, often misunderstood and taken out there. And, you know, some other th the other thing that uh, kind of I associate with Peter and, and me is, and Peter wasn't the fastest, and obviously John's Gospel records that, that Peter wasn't the fastest runner. Um, and uh, John says that he beat him to the, to the tomb of Jesus when the resurrection happened. But, so, so we often see ourselves in, in some, you know, some characters, but if we take an honest look, we, um, we can find ourselves very often in, the, in the, the not so popular character in the story. But you know, we're, in a, we're going through this uh, Gospel of John series at the moment, and um, I want to encourage you to listen to the, the previous two messages at least, if you can go back three or four, that'd be great. But um, and you can find them on our YouTube channel, or you can give us one of us a shout, and we'll send you the link. But um, particularly the last two, uh, just out of John chapter 13, and we're in John 13 again this week. Uh, we, we're reading the last portion of John chapter 13 from verses 31 to 38, and it's it's amazing for me. You know, I, I, I was saying to the chaps in the week, I've I've probably read John, I don't know, many many times, and, and John chapter 13. I've, I've read that over and over again, but again, it's just been so amazing how in the last few weeks, God has been um, bringing fresh revelation for this time, for now, for us, out of His Scripture. And it's just, it, again, it, it, it reaffirms for me that the, the Holy Scriptures, the Bible, is alive and active, and, and God makes that alive and active in us through His Holy Spirit. And I want to encourage you as you read the Scriptures, that you, you look for life in them. It's not just a matter of reading, but it's a, a matter of reading the scriptures to find that life, to find Jesus in our lives. And I want to read for you, I'm going to read out of the NRV, and I hope you're there with me. We'll have some of the words up on the screen, but uh, John chapter 13, verse 31 to 38 goes like this. When he was gone, that is Judas, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this will all men know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? I tell you the truth, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Amazing passage of scripture there, headed up as, as Peter's denial um, in the NRV. And just as we get to the end of chapter 13, I just want to recap quickly. You know, we, we read in the beginning of chapter 13 how uh, at the Last Supper, Jesus and the disciples are, are together. And, and Jesus takes the, the lowest possible position in that social setting that he could. He humbles himself to be a servant who washes their feet. And, and as we heard from Andy, it was just such a brilliant picture of, of how Jesus is putting his love into action. He doesn't just speak truths and just teach truths. He actually lives them out. And, and his coming to earth was that exact same moment of, of his humbling himself as a human being to come and to serve us. And that, um, that washing of the disciples' feet was just a practical, again, real demonstration for the disciples of how Jesus, our King, lives and how he came to serve and not to be served. So just a, a beautiful moment there at the beginning of John chapter 13. And then as we saw last week with the, 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 the part of the story of the betrayal, by Jesus, betrayal of Jesus by Judas and how Jesus in amongst, in, in amongst that passage, Jesus says those amazing verses that talk about the authority that he carries and how he has the authority from God. And, and anyone that he sends that carries his message has that same authority. And as we choose to submit to Jesus and to the gospel, we carry the authority of the Father wherever we go. We carry the authority of the King wherever we go, that Jesus is the King. And as it says in, in Matthew chapter 28, that Jesus, the risen, resurrected Jesus, says to his disciples, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to him. And that's the same authority that we carry as we go out with the gospel. We are the King's representatives as we go out with the gospel and as we 
choose to share his love with others. And so that brings us to this morning where we're at. And, and I want to just say out of, out of this scripture, this passage of Peter's denial, um, and again, there's just two verses in there that, are, that seem out of place when we read it. Um, but we are looking today at, at the kingdom of Jesus and, and what he institutes and what he um, really brings to the fore by his ministry on earth. Uh, is, is that God is the king and that the kingdom is advancing no matter what. The kingdom, is, the kingdom of heaven will advance no matter what. And Jesus says here, uh, just these two verses, I'm going to read them again for you and we'll put them up, but it's verses 34 and 35. Jesus says, a new command I give you, love one another. Now there's nothing new in that. We know that from the Old Testament, the love one another is already there, but, but here's the new part. That, that Jesus adds to this. And, and friends, commandments come from God. And, and so, so we've got to understand that Jesus here demonstrating that He is the King. And as He gives us a new command, that He is demonstrating subtly that He is the King. That He is under the authority of God. And He says, here, here's the new part, watch this. He says, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Jesus saying, the example that we must follow in order to love is His. That is the new command. So simple yet so profound. That is the, the beauty of what Jesus came to do. And verse 35 goes on. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Such a, again, such a simple thing. And there's these old, old hymns that we sing about that. And, um, but it's, again, giving us the keys to the, the power of the kingdom, I believe. Is, that's what Jesus is doing. As he knows his, his end, his time on earth is coming to an end. Um, and he gives his disciples the keys to the power of the kingdom. As, as we operate under the delegated authority of Jesus, as we are messengers sent by him, this is the message that we carry, friends. This is the power of the kingdom that we carry, is the example of Jesus and the love that he demonstrated. And that is how we are going to operate in power, is when we operate in the power of the love of Christ out of that delegated authority from the Father and and. Just in that, this, this verse does two things for me. One, it inspires me and it gives me courage. But two, it also daunts me a little bit because we know from Spider-Man that with, with great power comes great responsibility. And so our example can also deter people from, the, from, from Jesus and from, from the message of the gospel. If our, if our love is bad, if, if the way we demonstrate that love isn't truly the example that Jesus said. So we, we get to carry the, the power of the kingdom, but we also carry that responsibility that what we do demonstrates the gospel. Not that we do in order to earn the gospel, but people look at us as Christ followers, as, the, as those delegated with the authority of the king, as the ambassadors, as those who carry the message of the good news. We carry that power of our example, the power of the love of Jesus. Are we willing in social settings to take the lowest place to put the towel around us and wash people's feet. To clear up the plates and go and wash the dishes. Whatever it might be in that, in that moment, are we willing to lay our lives down for the gospel? Jesus um, is, is a perfect example of selfless and self-sacrificing love for us. Dallas Willard puts it this way. He says, God makes himself and his kingdom available. Not in every way human beings have imagined, surely. But in a simple way. That simple way is Jesus. Beautiful, beautiful quote, friends, that God makes himself and his kingdom available in Jesus. The example we see from Jesus is the kingdom example that we should be living our lives by. You know, during this time of lockdown, the government has made um, some, some help available. They've, they've got this one scheme, it's called the TERS, the UIF TERS scheme, uh, T-E-R-S, temporary employer or employee um, relief scheme. It's a temporary thing where uh, employees and employers can, can claim and try and get help. And I want to look at um, just how Jesus walks with Peter. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put out Jesus' Ter's scheme here. And it's, uh, it's, we'll get to what it is now. But, you know, if we, if we look at Peter in this narrative that we've been looking at in John chapter 13, Peter here gets stuck on the thing of Jesus going where he can't go. And Peter says, uh, again, the brashness, just the, the, the exuberance of Peter, the heart on the sleeve kind of guy. He's like, man, I'll follow you to death. There's, there's no way that you can go that I won't follow you, Jesus. I'm with you. I'm for you. We've got this. 
He's got his sword strapped on. He's expecting this military fight. The, the rough fisherman is going, give me, those, give me those temple clowns. We'll take them on. I'm not scared of anybody. And Jesus is just going, you know what, Peter? I love your exuberance, but I'm afraid it's, it's not even going to happen tonight. And, and Peter is a bit shocked by this. But if we follow Peter's story, and, and just for, t- for time's sake, and, and to make sure we're all on the same page from here, uh, Peter, gets, Peter goes with Jesus from the Last Supper here. Um, they go out into the garden, and, and he's one of the few that Jesus takes on a bit further, and he's, he falls asleep while Jesus is praying. And then um, as this mob comes with Judas to come and arrest Jesus, uh, we get the account in John where Peter is the one who pulls the sword out and he uh, attacks the, the servants, uh, the high priest's servant, and cuts off his ear. And Jesus says, no, no, stop that, and heals the chap's ear. And then Jesus gets arrested and taken off, and Peter follows at a distance um, to the courtyard. Jesus is inside being, uh, being questioned and, and being falsely accused, and, and Peter's outside by the fire, and he, he denies Jesus three times, and uh, he, he shows immense remorse for that. Um, Jesus is crucified, and uh, yeah, Peter, uh, Peter then, uh, the resurrection, and as I said, Peter runs to the temple when he gets the news that Jesus' body is not there. And then they see the resurrected Jesus. They're all hiding behind locked doors. And Jesus comes and and speaks to them. And again, later on, um, Jesus visits them as they're out. They're out and about fishing. And Jesus comes to them and they come onto the beach. And we see Jesus' restoration of Peter. And and then at Pentecost, uh, we see Peter standing up for the twelve and and leading um, the disciples and the apostles in that moment in, in, in a public declaration. So how do we go... You know, I, I looked at Peter and I said, how do we go from this man who, who denies Jesus in front of a campfire at night on his own to a servant girl to somebody who's prepared to stand up in the broad daylight in front of a crowd of thousands of people who are laughing at them and mocking them uh, for what they see as drunkenness. And, and Peter's able to stand up and testify about Jesus. And he's able to, to stand in front of the Sanhedrin and, and just declare to them, he said, well, do what you like to me. I'm going to follow Jesus. So how do we go from... This man who is so um, exuberant, but unable to follow through on, on, his, on his own zeal and, and his own exuberance. So to a man who is able to stand up with all authority and, and preach the gospel to whoever he comes face to face with. And as I said, we're going to look at, at just four things that, uh, that Jesus does for Peter in this moment. And, and the way that Jesus loves Peter, and it's a terse scheme, a T-E-R-S um, are we going to we're going to look at those four things and the first thing that Jesus does with Peter is he tells him the truth Jesus knows that Peter is going to deny him as he knew that Judas was going to betray him and he knows that uh, Peter's heart is for him but that Peter's flesh is weak and so Jesus tells him the truth he says you know what Peter you're going to deny me but before the night ends you're going to deny me three times and Jesus loves Peter enough to tell him the truth. As, as much as it stings Peter, and Peter's going, no way, so it'll never happen. Jesus is honest with him. And we see this a little bit earlier in, if we look in, in Jesus and Peter's walk together in Matthew 16, where Peter has this amazing confession of Christ, of you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, Matthew chapter 16. And, and immediately after that, Jesus tells them he's going to die. And Peter says, never, you'll, we'll never let that happen. And Jesus says to him, get behind me, Satan. You see, Jesus was never afraid to be truthful with Peter. And he spoke the truth in love to Peter. And that's the key. You know, we can often speak the truth in a harsh way that breaks people down. But when Jesus comes and speaks the truth in love to us, friends, it may hurt and it, it, it may cut us. But we know that God does that for our good. We know that he, he speaks the truth because he loves us. The second thing, the E, to us, T-E, uh, is the encouragement. Peter, uh, Peter is encouraged by Jesus. If we look at Luke's account of, of uh, Peter's denial, Luke chapter 22, Jesus says to Peter that Satan had asked to sift all the disciples, but he's praying for Peter, especially that when he is strengthened, that he will come back and strengthen his brothers, and he'll come back and strengthen the other uh, disciples and apostles. So, so Jesus here says to Peter, he says, you know what, I, I see what's going to come, and I see what's coming in your life, but I can also see beyond that what's going to happen and the good that God is going to bring out of that. And I want to encourage you with this, Peter, that, that even though you're going to fail and fall, there's still some, some good that God is going to do with you. And, and he gives Peter this encouragement to that. And even though he knows Peter's going to deny him, he still takes Peter with him 
uh, along with James and John in the Garden of Gethsemane, takes him out from the other disciples and keeps them close. Jesus still encourages Peter with his presence, his closeness in that, in that moment. Thirdly, the R, T-E-R-S, the, the R there, is that Jesus restores Peter. You know, we were in a, in a Zoom meeting the other day and uh, John Lofty Wiseman said, you know, God is in the business of restoration. And it's absolutely true. I love those old car restoration projects because we love to see the before and after picture. And the essence of what Jesus' love is, is in restoration. He restores us to right relationship with God. And he restores Peter in this moment. And Jesus loves Peter enough that even, the, even though the restoration process is painful for Peter, that Jesus loves him enough to restore him as much as he's denied Jesus. We see that after the resurrection when Jesus comes and they're out fishing and Peter comes rushing in and Jesus has a fresh fry there and he says to Peter, he says, three times he asks Peter, do you love me? Peter, remember, Peter, Peter denied Jesus three times and three times Jesus asked, do you love me? And it's just such a beautiful moment of reconciliation that Peter has there with Jesus where Jesus restores Peter. And the final thing that we see in, in the way that Jesus loves Peter is that Jesus leaves and sends the Holy Spirit. Mark Lonsdale in his uh, devotion on Wednesday wrote that right at the end, the reason, one of the reasons why Jesus had to leave was so that we could get the Spirit. And Jesus said, it's good for you that I go so that the Holy Spirit can come. And I believe that the crux in the, in the matter of the change in Peter from somebody who denies Jesus to somebody who proclaims Jesus boldly with authority is a spirit-filled life. And I believe that that's the, the best way that Jesus can love us is to give us the Holy Spirit, is to give us that presence. The prophecy fulfilled out of Joel, um, the thing that was longed for so often in the Old Testament times is God with us permanently, God with us always, the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. It is such a profound mystery and truth that we get to live under this king who is with us in all authority and we carry that power by his love um, and just quickly for us today those four things apply that that as we live out verses 34 and 35 the demonstration of the love of jesus as we demonstrate that love to the world by loving one another this is how it works out for us so t we can speak the truth in love we can speak the truth boldly and gently. And we don't have to wait for people to, to earn the right or, or, or to be good enough for us to speak the truth to them. You see, Romans 5, chapter 8 is clear that Christ died for you and me while we were still sinners. While we were His enemies, He laid down His life for us. Friends, maybe there is family, maybe there are people in your life, colleagues, whatever, who need to hear the gospel. And are you bold enough and, and do you have enough love for them to be able to share the gospel with them? Do you have... Do you, do you love them enough as Christ loved them to be able to get rid of your shyness and whatever it is about that, but to speak the truth in love to those people, to demonstrate the truth in love to those people, to, to tell them the truth of their destiny without Jesus and how there is a beautiful life we can live when we lay down our lives and we take the gift, we receive the gift of life that God offers us through Jesus. We need to speak the truth in love to people. Whether they're going right or wrong, we need to be those who speak the truth in love. And secondly, encouraging. Are we demonstrating our love by encouraging other people? We need to live lives that are prophetic lives. In order to be those who encourage, in order to be those who, who bring encouragement, we need to be listening and hearing from God. Encour the willingness to encourage begins with a heart that is open to hearing what God wants to say. You see, true encouragement brings courage. It's the root of the word, but encouragement builds others up and it brings them to the place of going, man, I'm okay. It's, it, 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 encouragement is not just, hey, you've lost weight or man, your, your hair looks really good or that's not encouragement. Those are just minor compliments that last a little bit. But an encouragement which says things like, Peter, Satan has asked to sift you, but when you have turned back, you will strengthen your brothers. You will strengthen your brothers. You will be a source of strength to others. Friends, that is the, that is the encouragement that we need to, to demonstrate in our love for one another. It's a, it's a prophetic hearing from God, a seeing what God sees in other people, and a, and a calling out of that thing in others. You know, there's a, there's a famous saying that says, our words create worlds, which means that essentially the things we say and we speak over people, 
creates worlds, and very often it creates it for ourselves, or we're using negative language all the time. But we uh, have the power of love in others' lives to demonstrate the kingdom and to, to bring the kingdom in their lives through the way that we speak and through the encouragement that we can speak into their lives. Are we, are we able to call out the gold in others that God sees, see through God's eyes, see what Jesus saw in those moments? And, and again, it, it's, it's that demonstration of Jesus' love where he loved perfectly, able to see beyond the immediate flaws in people and see beyond the immediate denial of Peter to, to what is going to come through Peter and call that thing out. That's the encouragement that we can give people as we love them. And restoration, the R, T-E-R-S, the, the, the restoration, how we can live that today. You're going, well, no, no, it's God's business. Jesus is in the business of restoration, not me. Friends, I want to say Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 says that when we see a brother or a sister who is struggling or in sin, that we should be the ones who restore them gently. That we as their brothers and sisters in Christ, we are the ones who should be restoring them gently. We should be lifting them up encouraging them, bringing them out of that place. Now, the first two, um, speaking the truth and, and, and encouraging people, to a certain degree can be done without Jesus. But I believe that this, this one, the R, is where, is where we need Jesus the most in these things because we need His love flowing through us to restore others. Sometimes that moment of restoration is asking for forgiveness. Sometimes that moment of restoration is helping someone up. Maybe it's giving them a plate of food. Maybe it's sharing some money with them, whatever it might be, is restoring that person back to wholeness. And again, the only way that we're going to know how to restore that person back to wholeness is if we ourselves are hearing God. Remember, Jesus said he only did what he saw the Father doing and he only spoke what he heard the Father speaking. Can we be a people who love like Jesus loved? We're out of a place of hearing and seeing what God is busy with, that we are able to love into others' lives and restore them gently back to fullness and back to wholeness. And lastly, the S, the Spirit-filled life. Friends, we, we can only truly love like Jesus if we have the Spirit of Christ. As we want to love in this moment and, and, and advance the kingdom through the love of Jesus and the example that He shared, the only way we can do it is through the power of the Holy Spirit. I guarantee you, if you try and do this in your own strength, you'll be dead and buried and exhausted before the month is out. Before the lockdown level changes, you'll be dead on your feet because... It is only through the empowering life that the Holy Spirit brings in us that we are able to overflow with the love of Jesus into the lives around us. And so I want to ask you in this week as we explore the kingdom and, and living within this amazing kingdom that God has set up at the beginning of time and, and will come to the end. And we get to live in part of it now, but we know that its fullness is still coming. The, the fullness of the kingdom of God is still coming. Um, I want to say for us who who are maybe unsure of how to do this now in the lockdown or, you know, it doesn't feel like I'm in the right place and everything's getting messed up by this COVID-19 and things are being cancelled and all the stuff I wanted to do and I'm not getting better and whatever it might be, whatever those things are, businesses failing, financial struggles. And, and friends, I'm aware personally of, of very much of, of the struggles that many of us are going through, me included. And this has been a great con comfort to me is that, um, and, and again, it's another Dallas Willard quote, but I'm going to leave you with this, is that we are built to count as water is made to run downhill. We are placed in a specific context to count in ways no one else does. That is our destiny. And friends, it's such an encouragement for me in that moment where I realize that no matter where God's got me, no matter where God has me, there is no interruption that is too big for Jesus in my life. You see, we might not even be aware that God has been building stuff into us over the last few weeks or months or perhaps even years that He has slowly but surely been weaving into your life for a moment like this, for the context that you are in, for the family that you're a part of, for the business that you're a part of, hopefully, for wherever you're at. God has got you in this moment and he's, he's been building stuff in your life and He will continue to. But for right now, friends, I want to say to you that God has you in this context now for a specific moment like this. You know, friends, I believe that we are made to matter. We're not just made of matter, but we are made to matter. And as we live out this example that we've seen over the last few weeks out of John chapter 13, where we live 
um, serving those around us, willing to, to lay down everything. You know, I heard, a, I remember an old Egyptian pastor uh, once said, he said, it's not what you can do for God, it's what you can let go of. What are we able to let go of in this moment to be able to serve those around us, to, to, to humble ourselves and become the lowest so that we can serve? And in that place, are we able to operate under the authority of the King as the delegated authority of the Father through Jesus to us as we carry that gospel out to go and deny ourselves and, and live in a way that shows and demonstrates the power of the kingdom through the love that Jesus demonstrates. Friends, I believe that as we live lives that demonstrate the love of Jesus, that we will matter more than anything else in the world, that our lives will count for more than anything that we could ever imagine or have dreamed of doing or accomplishing in our lives. I want to say, friends, let us not be afraid to live out that example of Jesus, to live out under the authority with the power of the kingdom in this love of Jesus that he demonstrated, loving one another in the way that Jesus showed us how. Let us go and change our communities. Let us change our families. Let us change the world around us through the love of Jesus. Friends, there is great power in love that lays itself down. I want to say that Jesus loves you and he wants to love others through you if you'll let him. Speak the truth in love. Encourage Bring restoration and live a spiritful life. God bless, my friends. Enjoy the week. Enjoy the devotions that are coming up. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you that you sent Jesus to be the perfect example for each and every one of us. Thank you, Jesus, that you were faithful to come as a servant on earth. Thank you that you demonstrated so perfectly that love that is so self-sacrificial the love of God that lays itself down for us, for you and I. Father, thank you that um, your authority is delegated through Jesus to us, that we can live lives of submission to your good authority, that we can live with, uh, within your kingdom under a good king. And thank you that as we live in that place, as we live in that place of submission, that we can operate in the power of your kingdom, that we can operate in the power of your love, that is demonstrated through Jesus. And I want to ask God that you would help each and every one of us this week to live out that power, God, to live out that love in our lives, whatever that might be, whether it be through word or through action, God. Let us live out the power of the love of Jesus this week. We give you glory. We give you praise. We give you honor, God. We know that as your word says that you are glorified through Jesus. And as we carry that message and as we carry Jesus where we go, may you get all the glory, God. We pray these things in your wonderful, mighty, powerful, loving name, Jesus. Amen. Amen, friends. God bless.